On this episode of The Glory Hour, the harrowing realities of human trafficking, we're taking a look at the hidden crisis happening in our world and how it's infiltrated our culture with the recent document dump from Jeffrey Epstein's case, plus a conversation with former SWAT operator and government explosive security specialist Joe Sweeney. He's going to share his story of how one terrifying phone call caused him to spring into action and track down traffickers targeting teens online, and we're going to get into how one ministry is providing trauma-informed mentorship for survivors and at-risk youth in one of the biggest trafficking hotspots in Pennsylvania. Welcome to the Glory Hour, where spirit meets culture. I'm so excited that you are joining us for such a special conversation today. You know, January is National Human Trafficking Awareness Month, and God put it on my heart, put it on my spirit, that it is so important for us to take a look at this evil, to take a look at the darkness, to take a look at what's happening and what's going on in our world, but happening right here in America. What's this hidden crisis, this pandemic that is going on? It is so important for us to be informed, so important for us to be aware, and so important for us to be knowledgeable about what is going on with this crisis. And you know, as always, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to The Glory Hour. Throughout this whole conversation, we'd love to hear from you, your thoughts, and even if you've witnessed human trafficking, even if you're you know, dealing with human trafficking, whatever it may be, this is a safe space because we're gonna have resources coming up for you if you know someone, if you've been impacted by it. So we wanna make sure that you're informed and you are connected and well aware of what's going on with human trafficking. And you know, when it comes to trafficking and sexual exploitation and prostitution, it is a big culture to conversation in our culture right now. You know, thousands of documents connected to convicted sex offender Jerry Epstein have been released detailing his sexual abuse and trafficking of underage girls. And also, this is really making headlines, the 150 people, including politicians and public figures who are in contact with him. You know, we're hearing more disturbing details about Epstein's island in the Caribbean, a recent release of court documents revealed young women who were there. And I read this article from PBS NewsHour that says that two of his alleged victims spoke to Miami Herald investigative reporter Julie K. Brown. And listen to this. The woman said they just want justice. Can you like I can't even imagine if, you know, being in this, situ this situation and all the news and things that are swirling around it. But these women are saying they just want justice because they know there are a lot more people that were involved in the sex ring. I mean, how massive, how, you know, everything that was going on, they're saying there's other people that have to be, had been connected to in, in order for this to survive, in order for this to just keep going, in order for the abuse and all of that, the manipulation to happen. I mean, it's truly horrific what we're hearing coming out of it. And, you know, the documents include claims from Epstein's alleged victims that the prominent men who had socialized with them and had to have known what was going on and failed to say anything. And one of the alleged victims testified in court according to the documents that when you actually walked into Epstein's home, this is a little dark and I, I feel like, ugh, but we have to speak the evil that's out there so we know what's going on and what's happening, that there were actually inappropriate pictures of girls everywhere in his home. Y'all, this is a problem, this is an issue, and we cannot turn a blind eye to it. Who knows how many victims, who knows how many people have been um, impacted by this, and so it is so important for us to be aware of the evils and the ills going on in our culture. For me, as a sexual trauma survivor, I could not imagine being in a network I could not imagine being in a sex ring. I could not imagine the horrific abuse that they have faced, the horrific things that they have witnessed and saw, and even what it did to their psyche and to their mind. It's, a, it's unfathomable. It's truly unfathomable. And you know, as this Jeffrey Epstein case continues to unfold with the unsealing of documents, let's take a wider look at the impact of human trafficking around the world. Take a look at this graphic. We want to give you some statistics and things just so you can understand really how bad this crisis is. So let's take a look at this, this, uh, the statistics. It's on appearing on your screen. So this comes from the U.S. Department of State and, State and also Crisis Aid. Listen to this. About 27.6 million people worldwide are currently being trafficked. They're currently stuck in this vicious cycle. Human trafficking is the second largest and fastest growing criminal industry. Listen, think about that. It's the second largest and fastest growing criminal industry because there's so much money connected to it. It's, I, I, it just leaves me speechless. And this is really, I think we need, this is sobering. We need to take into 71% 
that are trafficked are women, 25% are children. 71% of all those trafficked are women, and 25% are children. Let us let that sink in for a moment. Take a moment to pause and think about all of those who are in America, all of those that are in different parts of the world that are literally right now in the throes and the grips of human trafficking. I can't even imagine the screams, the tears that they cry silently, the atrocities and the abuse that they face on a daily basis. We cannot turn an eye from this. We cannot act like it is not happening. This is reality. This is happening in our world, in America, right before our eyes. This is a pandemic that is unfolding and it is getting worse and worse. But it is so important that as Christians, as the children of God, that we step in and we be the light. And that's why I'm excited for our next conversation. Our guest today is a man of God on mission and on the front lines, helping to fight against the evils of human trafficking. Joe Sweeney is the CEO and founder of the Acervo Project, an organization which works with government agencies and Homeland Security to track predators targeting children and teens online. For 29 years, he devoted himself to serving our country and our communities as a former SWAT operator, bomb squad commander, and U.S. government explosive security specialist. Joe, it is such an honor to have you on the Glory Hour. Oh, thank you, Cindy. It's a pleasure to be here. We appreciate it. Well, Joe, before we get into the great work the Asover Project is doing, let's talk a little bit about your background because you have roots here in the city of Pittsburgh, and it's really that part of you know your upbringing has shaped where you are today. So let's talk about that. Sure, sure. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a Pittsburgher, born and raised here uh, in the neighborhood of Hazelwood, you're right right outside of downtown, and you'll hear my Pittsburghese as we continue. Um, and growing up here in Pittsburgh was a great experience, you know, and uh, was afforded a lot of different things as a kid, um, even though it was a it was a rough area. But um, met some really fine people and really, I think the church that I attended as a kid just really laid the, the basics of what, what you're supposed to be, you know, and, and how you're supposed to conduct yourself. But my career started here in Pittsburgh. Uh, I was with the Pittsburgh police for 11 and a half years. Most of my career, I was on the SWAT team, as you mentioned, and on the bomb squad. Then after 9-11, I had an opportunity to go to work for the Department of Homeland Security. And uh, so I, I applied and I got hired as an explosive security specialist from the skills I, I um, acquired through the city, you know, and the training that we went through and all that. So I was with Homeland Security for a little over four years. Then after that, I went into contracting, what they call government contracts where I worked in the uh, anti-terrorism programs. Uh, the State Department runs dozens of these programs. And my job there was uh, for almost 14 years. We would, we would travel to countries who were allied with the United States, would fly in, would train them, equip them, the mission support them in combating terrorism in their countries. And I'd done that up until just a little over two years ago uh, because the Asovo Project, we were getting so busy uh, my time had to be here. So I um, I left that, which, you know, as a contractor, you can come and go in that position. But it was a great experience because during those years with the city and the government, I, I acquired a lot of skills. I acquired a lot of relationships with people with different skills. So I have a big Rolodex. And when, <clears throat> when I got a call to help rescue some kids, uh, we'll talk about that. It, it, it come to mind that I have access to all these people that could support this mission to help support law enforcement and other organizations in rescuing these kids, education, and recovery. And, uh, you know, that all started in 2016. Yeah. I happened to be in the Middle East at the time, and a colleague of mine had called, you know, we keep in touch, all of us over time, every few weeks we're checking in. And he said, uh, Hey, uh, I got a couple American children that were taken to South America. I could use you on the team to go get them. And I told him, I said, well, I'm over here in the Middle East for another month or a month and a half, but I'll give you a call. And I knew he was doing this. He was a retired agency case officer. 
been retired for years doing this, helping locate missing American children. So after that conversation, I, I don't know why that particular time we spoke about it resonated with me to start looking deeper into missing children, child exploitation. And I started, I started to do that. So literally for the next seven to eight months, um, I, I did a really deep dive into human trafficking, child exploitation. And what blew me away was the scope of this epidemic. I, I've traveled all over the world. I, I, I've seen it. I've seen it in limited fashion in these countries and also here in the States. I mean, it was so bothersome to me. It's like I tell people, it's like God put a post-it note on my forehead and I couldn't get it off. Mm-hmm. Like, you need to do something. You need to get involved with this. So after about eight months, um, I, and I was still deploying in different places, I come home and I talked to my wife and I said, look, I can't research this anymore. I, I, I think I know enough that we, we have to do something. And, uh, you know, she had she had questions and she's like, Joe, you, you know, you're gone six, seven months out of the year. You know, we, we start having grandkids now and you're never here. And now you want to take this on. And I'm like, yeah, but now that we know, I, I don't know how we walk away. So she agreed, and um, in March of 2017, we formed the Acervo Project, and Acervo is Latin for Watch, Rescue, Guard. I, I, I love that. I love that, Joe, just the story of just it took that one phone call and just hearing the desperation of what's needed, you know, with children being kidnapped and just even when you were talking about uh, the scope of what it is in this epidemic and this crisis of human trafficking, because I really feel like we don't truly understand the depth. We, you know, here in America, you know, we we just don't understand. Can you just paint a picture for us of how bad it is in America and all around the world, just from based on your experiences and things that you have been able to experience and see? Sure, sure. But one thing I like to point out, it's the most underreported crime there is. And so we, we look at these statistics and, you know, at best they're conservative. But, you know, let's say in the United States what it looks like. The majority of the sex trafficking has been under the guise of prostitution. And our society has sort of accepted that as the world's oldest profession. Hey, you know, is growing up and you have bachelor parties, you know, they have that type of thing that you got to go and start this start this path as a man. And so I think it's been accepted without really peeling back the onion, peeling the layers to really see what's the root of this. 85 to 90 percent of these individuals, mostly women, but there are men too trafficked in the sex trade are are trafficked. Only about 10 percent truly say they want to do it. It's sex work and they believe in that. Even there, there's a story behind that, I believe. But that just goes to show you, you know, the prostitution here, and that's anywhere, is is really the driving piece of it, is nobody really looks at it as an epidemic, as people being sold, as people being in these horrific conditions. And basically, there's been a vulnerability in their lives that's been exploited, whether it's been a uh, dysfunctional family, drugs and alcohol, mental health. You know, some kids are bullied. Some kids are you know, just not not really raised in a good environment. So they're looking for something. They're looking for somebody to love them. And these traffickers, they call them pimps. We call them traffickers. They sort of approach them with, I got you. I'll take care of you. You know, they feed them this whole narrative of a better life. When in reality, it's probably one of the most horrific things they go through. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also the forced labor piece. That does occur here. It's mostly servitude in the States. Overseas, it's flat out child labor, adult labor. A lot of families sell their kids because the poverty is so bad. Uh, and life is cheap in many of these countries. Uh, we've seen instances where we, we have we have five kids in Uganda we rescued. And one kid was kidnapped on the way to school. He was 12 years old. And they put him in a, he was in a labor camp at a timber company, clear cut and forest, for about nine months. And then finally he escaped and we got involved to take custody and care of him. And for nine months, they worked him about 14 hours a day. They also abused him. Uh, and now we, we support him in, 
in his health, his 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 counseling, and we're actually getting him get him getting him in, into a trade school this year to learn a trade because he's academically so far behind. But that's what we do. You know, we're a needs based organization. It's just not all about the rescues or identifying predators. It's about following through the, the total the total mission that has to take place. So those are two examples of, of what it looks like. You know, Jez, you're just talking. I just what came to my spirit is you're truly acting as a father for the fatherless because there's these children, there's these women, they're they're being exploded, exploited, excuse me, and just talking about these, you know, pimps, these traffickers are painting this narrative like, oh, I'll take care of you, but it's it's completely the opposite. And just as you were just sharing that story about the boy in Uganda, like my heart just breaks like I, I can't even imagine what life like that is like. I can't imagine the turmoil and the pain and just the things that he's wrestling with and dealing with. And I know with the Aserva Project, there's you have other children that you're helping um, in Uganda. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, yes. We, we have girls and boys there. <clears throat> the other four we've had in school for almost two years now. They range from ages from 12 to 16 now, th- their ages today. And we do the same thing. Once we they come in our care, they're really not our custody, but we have to fill out legal paperwork to, to you know, say, hey, we're going to pay for this. We'll take care of these needs. So we've done that. And we have them in grades from, we have one that just started as a, what would be equivalent of freshman in high school here. And the other ones are in elementary school. And we get them registered. We get them tested. We get them medically checked. And then once they're accepted, we pay for their tuition, their books, uh, all their school supplies, their uniforms, uh, their food, their lodging, and um, and also you know Christmas. We make sure they have a Christmas gift, and um, sometimes there's some other needs medically that, that they need. Typhoid and uh, malaria are really big. Mm. They've had it. Some of them have had it several times, and so when that occurs, we make sure they can get to the clinic, get the medicines. We follow up on their health. Uh, and we'll have them until they graduate. Mm. That's, that's, and that's one incredible. of our things is, yeah, wow. it's it's a, it's a big it's a big undertaking. Yeah, I mean, I, we could rescue twenty more tomorrow, yeah. but I just don't have the resources yet yeah. for that. But yeah. we're going to get them. I'm sure God will provide. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so so it's it's a it's a mission of that too to make sure they're safe and that they recover so they can live productive lives. And you know, one of the one of our initiatives is I, I want them to see if we can teach them English. Is another language, and we're hoping to get Bibles to them, so we can use the Bible to teach them English. Uh, that's one of our one of our programs we're going to try to initiate next year. That's incredible. I just love what's happening in Uganda, and also in Asia and Nepal. You're helping young people as well. Can you tell us about the Servo Project and the love of Jesus that you're serving to those kids in uh, Nepal? Sure, we got asked. We have a partner that that was going over there. There's a uh, recovery home over there that had 15 girls, and this was last year. And I got a phone call, and they said, uh, hey, we could use your help over here. And I was really trying not to go overseas anymore yeah. for now because we only have so much revenue and personnel. But they're like, listen, these 15 girls, ages uh, 8 to 15, uh, the traffickers find out where they are, so they're aggressively trying to get them back. And they need help with their security footprint. And they, they don't know, you know, how to really handle this this situation. I said, okay. So the next thing I know, I'm on a plane to Kathmandu. <laughs> so I went over there for a little over a week and met with their security team, met with the girls. Man, I tell you, I mean, move, move you is an understatement of these the spirit in these kids. And uh, so we, we agreed to help. So after that visit, I come back. And we drew up a uh, syllabus and a standing operating procedure. And we just had a team go over there a month ago, month and a half, went over there and trained their security staff and also their rescue teams. And uh, we're, we're, they want us back. There's more for them to learn. And three weeks after we trained their rescue teams, they rescued two girls out of one of the brothels. So they sent us that information, and it was really good to see. Now they're up to 28 girls in the house. Uh, and it's a problem there like it is anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the families sell the kids. Wow. And it's a legal battle over there because then the traffickers will go to the family who they bought them from and say, we want you to file custody 
of your child and get them off of those people that have them in the recovery home. Wow. And legally at times, sometimes they win. It blows your mind. Mm. They don't believe it or they, they, the courts, you know, the law's a little different everywhere, but, um, so that, there's a battle they fight there legally too. And if we can be of any type of support there, we will. I just love that, you know, you're even in the midst of the darkness and evil, the Acervo Project and your team on the front lines, helping the most vulnerable, because it is one thing I just love that you were just sharing of just how you're integrated and just making sure that they have a better, a chance at a better life, a chance at a better future than, you know, the card of hands, the hand of cards that they've been dealt with. And Joe, let's talk for a moment. Um, something when I remember when we were talking earlier is, um, that was shocking to me is that just how, you know, human trafficking has changed with online predators and your organization does a lot of work with that because they are getting very crafty and they're using social media to lure children and to lure teens. And you have a lot of experience with that. So can you tell us about that? Because some of us may not be familiar that this is a new tactic that these traffickers are using to grab our children. Sure. In the United States, that is probably one of the premier ways that these child predators is a term we call grooming, right? Are, are out there making contact with our kids. And it's because of the cell phones and the tech. Um, the kids are on all these chat platforms, you know, you have kick, you know, uh, discord, Instagram, Facebook, not so much anymore, but so these predators are posing as another teenager and they're just out there starting these, um, innocuous conversations with these kids looking for vulnerability, looking for the kid that's complaining online about his life or her life, their parents, their brothers, their sisters, their school, nobody likes them. Um, so when they see that, they'll start this friendship. Yeah, I can relate. I left home because my dad was an alcoholic or my mom was a drug addict or whatever story they make up. They craft this whole narrative and the next thing you know, the, the, the kid thinks they're friends. They literally start this online relationship, but the child has no idea who this person is. Then they start the conversation of, they send me a picture. You know, then it goes, they send me a picture, you know, an explicit picture. They'll, they'll go to that. And the next thing you know, the kids are sharing them. And I t we, we know that because we've spoke to over 5,000 kids in the last couple of years in junior and senior high school. We present them. The school district, and and they tell us they're sharing them. They're like, that's just the thing to do. That's what we do today. And now the predator has them. Then they start the extortion or the extortion. They ask for money. They ask for videos. They ask for pictures. Um, they'll ask to meet up. Sometimes the kids will meet with them, uh, even before they're exploited. And once they meet, there's an abuse that takes place. Typically, it's filmed. And the next thing you know, these kids, some of these kids are being trafficked. Uh, it's it's an epidemic. It, there's a stat that came out uh, not too long ago. They say one in five children are exploited online every nine minutes. That's staggering. Say that again. Staggering. Say that again, Joe. One in one in five children are exploited in some fashion online every nine minutes. Wow. It's unbelievable, and I can believe it because when we go to the schools and talk to these kids. They tell us, they're like, yeah, we've done it. We're sharing them with our friends. But we, you know, some of them, we come up and say, listen, I shared a video and a picture with this person, but I don't know them. What do I do? Well, you know, there's going to be accountability. We're going to have to figure it out. But we we connect them with resources. You know, law enforcement is the people they need to talk with. Also, there's some counseling in, in other places uh, that, that we can follow up with, people that we work with. But the, the child predator piece is huge. Child predators are everywhere and they walk among us. They're very smart. They really are very calculating. And um, and the laws aren't really the best to catch them and convict them. That's why we focus on trying to identify predators online. That's one of our main goals. And we do that because for every predator that we can identify and we share this information with law enforcement, if there's an arrest and conviction, that's 50 to 75, 75 children will not be approached or groomed by that individual. Wow. An average predator has 50 to 75 children in their friend circle that they're out there talking with. 50 to it's 75? Insane. Yep. Wow. Yeah. That's we've seen we've seen as many as a hundred 
but the average is probably 50 uh, because they're talking to all kinds of kids, you know, multiple conversations at one time. Uh, so that's how we see we can move the needle yeah. by identifying the predators, educating the kids. We collapse on the problem instead of just being in the rescue to revolving door, right? The pipeline's continually being fed. So we're trying to be outside of that, stopping it and educating it before it gets to the point that we have to, we have to rescue. Wow. Joe, this is, I, I just am so grateful for the wealth of wisdom and knowledge that you're just sharing with us because this is alarming, just hearing these statistics. And I, it's even hard for me to fathom right now in my mind, just what you've like shared with the children and, you know, with the Servo projects, you work with government agencies and Homeland Security. And can you just share with us just a, a testimony of a story just connected to the online predators where you saw results and somebody was rescued and just to paint the picture of this is, this is happening. This is this is real. We cannot turn a blind eye to it. Yeah, yeah. We we've had cases where um, we we've see, we've caught repeat offenders who were let out of jail early, right back online. Uh, we caught them twice, and then we just turn that around. We gather the information, share it with law enforcement, and then they'll take the case. We never we don't hand anything to law enforcement unless we've actually corroborated that it's trafficking or there's an attempt here by a child predator. Um, you know, we're not law enforcement. We we don't work with law enforcement in arrests or, you know, any of that type of thing. We're basically an intelligence gathering organization and we, we gather information and share it with the appropriate agencies. We're not door kickers. We don't kick in doors and rescue kids like that. Sometimes people get a, an impression we are because of our backgrounds. That was our old jobs, not this. Um, we are here as a, as a resource for law enforcement and other NGOs to help any way we can with the resources we have. Um, but we've also gotten, um, we had a case. We also do parent education seminars. It's a couple hours. We did one here in Pittsburgh, and I don't think there were 30 people there. Two months later, one of the people that attended had called me and said, hey, I don't know if you can help us. And I said, well, what's up? And here they had a, a ministry they supported in Mexico, and they called them and said, look, we have an American girl that just starts showing up here uh, every day for the free lunches. This ministry gave out free lunches Monday to Friday. Well, long story short, I asked them to get me a bunch of information, and all they could get me was the first name and a picture of her. Well, I'll just shorten it because I can't get into some of it. Yeah. Uh, we had a picture and a first name. And then 32 days later, we were working with our partners to get her out of Mexico back into the United States uh, with this with this extraction. And we got her out of there. And um, she's thriving in school. And her goal now is she wants to graduate high school early and become a Homeland Security agent and rescue kids. Uh, she was literally not far from being dead. She was so malnutrition and so abused. Her trafficker was was the family relative, um, also abusing her besides selling her. Uh, it was a horrible situation. And and it was by God's grace we were able to, to make that a success because in my past life, I've done rescues. And there was a lot that could have went wrong with this one. And not one thing did. Not one thing. Wow. Wow, Joe, that's, <sighs> I just think for all of us just to take a moment, like this is a true story of a young girl that, you know, be in any of our communities and this happen. And it is what you said by the grace of God. Thank God that, you know, you were able to respond and to act and collaborate with government agencies and come together to pull her out. And I just love now that she wants to work in Homeland Security and she wants to help those because she knows what it's like to be trapped. She knows what it's like to be in the darkness. She knows what it's like to be facing just like un unfathomable evil. I, I can't even imagine like what she's gone through, but now she's thriving and moving forward. And Joe, I want to make sure that, um, cause you have the, the Servo Project tip line and we have the number we want to put on the screen. Can you talk to us a little bit about the, um, the tip line that is 877-SAVE-994. Talk to us about the tip line and how it works and how, how your um, organization just goes on these leads. Sure. Yeah. We, 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 we got the tip line started maybe three, four years ago. And we started it because we were getting calls, 
people were reporting things to the national hotline and there's some others and they were saying like, no one got back to them or, you know, they didn't hear anything. And, and I told him, I said, listen, it's a national hotline. You can imagine how busy they are, you know? So, but as we started getting more calls, you know, especially locally, we thought, you know, why don't we have a tip line? Because we can respond to this tip line within hours. We're small, but you know, we can respond the way we set it up very quickly. So we started the tip line and basically you leave your, your message on there. It's a recorded line. People leave their name and their phone number and usually report activity that they suspect somebody is being trafficked or there's a child being exploited. Once we get that tip line, our investigators call the person back. Um, we'll gather more information. Some of it has to go to our cyber team. A lot of our work's on the computer and cyber, you know, on the internet. And once we cooperate or identify these these things that are occurring, then we'll share it with law enforcement. A lot of the tips aren't trafficking. A lot of the, the tips are mental health, you know, but we can identify that. So we're saving these types of tips going to law enforcement using their very valuable resources so that way it gives them more time to work the actual cases. Yeah. So it's a twofold mission there. Yeah. And it's a recorded line because we just don't have the bandwidth to yeah. staff it 24 hours. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, if people want to reach out to us, the tip line is for those types of messages, not if you want information. Yeah. Uh, although we'd get a few people calling, it's fine. But that that's why we started it. I mean, we're a needs-based organization where there's a need. And it falls within our mission statement. We'll do our best to, to fill that gap. I, I love how much how much the Acervo project is standing in the gap for the vulnerable, for those that are hopeless. And so, you know, I just even felt like when you were talking, Joe, is if you are just, you know, watching on the Glory Hour and you're on YouTube or there's something going on and you just happen to stumble across this right now, this podcast, and maybe you have seen something or maybe you're experiencing it or whatever, just please give the tip line a call at 877-SAVE-994 because we want to see lives saved. We want to see, you know, I just think of Joe is Jesus is a redeemer. Jesus is the one that is pulling us from the pit and the perils of darkness. And I am just, it's such an honor that, you know, we've had a chance to meet and to talk and to communicate. And I just so appreciate your heart, Joe. I so appreciate how you are literally in the trenches and just making sure that this generation is safe. And as we were having our, you know, our conversation, one thing I thought about, you know, I'm, I'm 35 years old, I'm a millennial. And I remember being in AOL chat rooms, right? And these, and there were pro there were pro predators then probably, you know, sending certain things like your age, sex, location, all these things. The world has changed so drastically. I can't even imagine what it would be like to be a teenager at this age with, you know, social media, your fingertips on your phone, reaching out, you know, dealing with all like self-esteem issues, loneliness, things at home, and don't even know that they can fall into the grips and the traps of trafficking, of prostitution, of sexual exploitation. So I just want to say from the depth of my heart, thank you for what you're doing for the kingdom of God. Thank you for what you're doing for this next generation. And I'm believing that you are going to get even more help and more resources and finances and so that you're able to expand the reach of the Acervo Project because what you're doing is such an incredible work. Well, thank you. And it, it, you know, we're blessed to be doing it. We really are. It, it, it's a way of life for us and everybody that works here. Um, everybody's here because they, they see it uh, and they just, they feel, they feel called. Yeah. I can't put it any other way. Um, and I don't know how, once you're aware of it, you don't get involved in some fashion. Um, but, you know, everyone has, there's different life skills and things going on, but, um, you know, at least I would, I would offer this too. at least educate yourselves on this problem. You know, folks out there, if they're, they're suspecting things or haven't heard a lot about it, you can go online and just start Googling human trafficking organizations or the Homeland Security has a great website called the Blue Campaign. Go on there. It'll really give you a lot of information because I'm sure there's children and young adults in their lives that they may be concerned about. So, and if we can get ahead of that with them, we'd be happy to. Yeah.
That's truly incredible. And also want to make sure that, you know, our viewers, if you're watching the Glory Hour, that you go check out the Acervo Project because it's theacervoproject.org. And so make sure that you go and check it out, the incredible work they're doing. Support them if you can. So, Joe, I just want to thank you so much for our conversation, so much for our time. And I'm truly believing that I know I've been so blessed and so touched of, like, the stories and the testimonies and just the statistics that you shared about the plight of human trafficking and, you know, standing together, like, ending this modern day slavery, the sexual exploitation, the prostitution, and that these pimps and these predators will be rescued. And even for them, that they would come to know Jesus. Amen. Correct. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Amen to that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joe. You know, it's so eye-opening what Joe was just sharing about the scope of trafficking, the scope of exploitation all over the world. And I just want to share with you an article in the Associated Press, which sparked the focus of this show today on human trafficking. You know, listen to what's happening to many Rohingya refugee girls who have fled because of the conflict that's happening in Myanmar between Bangladesh. You know, the AP reports this. This really broke my heart when I read it. Scores of girls are being forced to become child brides in Malaysia, the young girl said that they're in abusive marriages, being held hostage. They're being held hostage by controlling husbands who won't let them see outside. Could you imagine not even being able to see the sun, hear the rain? Like you hear the rain, you can't see the rain. Not even be able to be outside. That just breaks my heart. Several said that they have been beaten and raped by traffickers. It's heartbreaking. You see, these are some of the photos of the Rohingya community. And here's some background on the Rohingya refugees, if you're not familiar. They are a Muslim ethnic minority who lived in Myanmar, and thousands have fled the country because they have been de denied basic rights and protections and are extremely vulnerable to exploitation. And that's exactly what we're seeing and we're hearing about with these Rohingya child brides. And so I just really feel, you know, I just want to take a moment and just to pray for them because I could not imagine being a 12, 13, 14 teenage girl, right, being forced into this situation, fled from everything. I had to flee from everything that I knew because of violence and because of persecution. And now I'm in the situation where I feel like I have no hope. It's so heartbreaking. So Father God, we just come right now and we lift up the Rohingya girls, Father God, that are right now in the grips and the throes of abuse, of control, of manipulation, Father God. We pray, Holy Spirit, that Yeshua, Jesus, that you would just come to them, that you would go into those homes, that you would go into those places. You would be there right now, God, as they're screaming inside, as they're crying silently, and that you would dig down deep and touch their heart and that they would have an encounter with you, Jesus, because you are Emmanuel, God, with us. You are the God that heals the brokenhearted. And Father God, we pray on behalf of the Rohingya girls and every girl and every child and every woman, Father God, that is in the grips and the throes of this right now, that Lord Jesus, that you would have your way. And we just declare and decree, and I just feel this in the spirit, that even there would be more busts, that we even saw what happened in you know, Florida, that there was a recent bust of traffickers, that more and more bust would happen so that those who are in the grips of modern day slavery, those are in the grips of that bondage and that control, that they would be set free and they would see your light again. In Jesus name. Amen. Back here at home in the U.S., Pennsylvania ranked as the 15th worst state for human trafficking, and central Pennsylvania is now considered a hotspot, and one ministry in the Keystone State is providing hope and healing to survivors and at-risk youth through trauma-informed mentorship and awareness. Amy Thurston is the CEO, president, and co-founder of Hope Inspire Love, which is an organization based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, shining a light on the darkness of trafficking. Thank you so much, Amy, for joining us. Yes, it's an honor to be with you. Thank you so much for letting us share about what Hope Inspire Love is doing. Yeah, like it's truly incredible the work that you're doing. So can you just tell us a little bit about you and Hope Inspire Love? How did it get started? How did God truly birth it in your heart? Yeah, powerful story. And Hope Inspire Love, we are a community impact, faith-centered nonprofit in the Lancaster County area. And we provide services in the surrounding area to those that have been exploited or trafficked from human trafficking. So we see the at-risk population and we try to meet that need. But Hope Inspire Love was actually founded because of a subway ride heading into Philadelphia. And so we had... Um, 
this individual that was literally on their way to an interview to Philly and got off the train onto the metro right off of 30th Street. And while they were on that subway and they were headed to that interview, they were preparing and this older gentleman and younger girl got on the metro at that point. And at first it looked like a father and a daughter. And then as this gentleman kind of looked a little further, saw that this young girl wasn't dressed for the right weather, did not have a backpack or a phone. And the man was so much older than her that the kind of dynamic between the two just did not seem like a father-daughter relationship. And as this gentleman was on his way to the interview, he kept looking around and you could tell other people on the Metro kind of was like, what is that situation? But did not know what to do. And there were a lot of red flags in that situation, but this this man was focused on this interview thinking, okay, I need to get there. And yet I can't not see what I saw. And for those of us that are believers, he sensed the Holy Spirit. We say it's that gut check of, hey, there's something not right here, but what do I do? What, what am I supposed to do? And because you're on a metro, there's no signal. So he was trying to look up on his phone and had no service. And when he did finally able was able to make eyes with that young girl, he said she couldn't have been more than 13 or 14 years old. And he saw such darkness and hopelessness in her eyes. He said he could tell a story just by the, her eyes and what she was expressing. And in that moment, he thought, well, do I do something? And if so, what would that look like? Fast forward a few minutes later, he still saw this gentleman kind of being a little tough with this woman, speaking down to her. And he saw that nobody else was doing anything. And he was able to look at her one more time. And in that moment, he's like, I have to do something. But the gentleman that she was with saw him look at her. He grabbed her and got off the next stop. In that moment, that young man wasn't able to do anything. But he went to the interview, found out he received the job. It was an awesome opportunity. But he came home and he shared with his wife, I saw something today I cannot unsee. And I feel like I was on that metro for a reason. And that man was my husband, who is our co-founder, Steve Thurston. And he came home telling me this is something we had to do. And I said, but what would that look like? You know, what, you know, what would you have done in that situation? You could just grab her and rescue her. Like, that's not, that's not our job. Like, what could we have done? And as we began to research and see all the signs and everything about trafficking, we saw Pennsylvania was a hub for trafficking. And here we are living outside of King of Prussia at the time. And this was back in 2017. And we said, okay, wait, where are the key areas that this is happening that people are unaware? And Lancaster County was one of those areas. And so we literally uprooted our family. And I have to tell you, like, we, we, we didn't have jobs. We left what we knew. He said no to that job. And what's crazy about this opportunity that he had at that job, we found out later they never hired for his position. And that whole department closed. We know he was on that, that ride that day to see that young woman. And he tells me every day, I do this for that one. It's for that one that we saw that day. And he truly believes that one day he's going to meet that young woman. And he's going to say, during this time, this is all I did because I saw you, right? And isn't that what Jesus did? He came after the one, and that's the heart of what we do. So that is how we started. And it was all because of a man, which you don't usually see men in the anti-trafficking field, but his passion is what fueled the fire for us to start and for me to say, okay, I'm going to trust you, and we're going to leave everything behind, and we're going to move in faith. And that's what we did. And God provided, and we are now going into our seventh year through our outreach and awareness to our communities, prevention education for schools and businesses, churches and organizations, and then our trauma-informed mentorship that is meeting those in our community right where they are to watch them flourish and thrive and empower them that they can do this and God is with them through that. So that is how we got started and that's why we're here today. Amy, what an incredible story. And one thing that just, I was just like sitting back when you were just sharing it. So I lived in Philadelphia. So when you were talking about 30 Street Station, I went to Temple University. And after I graduated, because um, I studied for broadcast journalism, I lived in the city for a year and have some very, very familiar with Philadelphia. I'm very familiar of taking SEPTA and going on the orange line or the blue line. And so I've been on that very train. And it just sitting here when you were sharing, I was like, oh, my gosh, just so awestruck um, because how many times like you sit on the subway and you're, you're just focused on going to that job interview or just going to work or trying to get to class or whatever it may be. And that happened. And you said this is 2017. I mean, I was I was there from 2006 to 2010. So how many times was I on the subway and this is going on and this is happening? And, you know, I just 
what what a God moment, even when you were sharing that, like that job later down the road, like it didn't even exist in the, you know, the department closed, like your husband, what's your husband's name? His name's Steve. Steve. So Steve was on a divine assignment from the Holy Spirit in that moment. And I love what you're saying. That's because of the one, the one that was on the train, that one young woman who knows what she was facing, who knows what she was going through, but because of your husband saying, okay, I'm going to go, but I'm going to, God couldn't peer his eyes off of her. That's truly incredible. Um, wow. What, what a God story. And, you know, Amy, you know, you touched on something, I, you know, being here in Pennsylvania, you know, Pennsylvania's ranked, um, as the 15th worst for human trafficking. Philadelphia is, you know, top city as well. So, and also talk to us about Pennsylvania and in central PA of Lancaster, because, you know, I, a lot of us, I just think of, you know, the Amish community, it's quiet and it's quaint. There's not so much going on, but there's a lot that is happening behind the scenes and what's going on. So can you talk to us and go deeper into that? What's going on in Lancaster? What's happening in central Pennsylvania? Right. And so like you were saying about Philadelphia, that is a huge hub. We've trained a lot of schools in that area and helping the schools with just not enough um, support systems for labor and sex trafficking. And so we're like, hey, we'll go, we'll meet you where you are. We meet people within an hour radius. We work with survivors within an hour radius. The goal is like when God brought us to Lancaster, we just said yes, but didn't know exactly what that meant. But if you would look, so Polaris is where all the reporting comes in for human trafficking. So where you got your number 15, that is coming from Polaris and they're reporting. And Polaris actually has a map of the United States of like where all these cases are coming from that are being called into their hotline. You would hone in on Pennsylvania. So we talked about it being number 15, but then you look at the hot spots of like where those red dots are on that map you're going to see that it's Philadelphia, Lancaster, York, Harrisburg, Pittsburgh, like all these big city, you know, these areas. And you can see, but it's a, it's a transit, it's a transition, like a transit transient. I can't say that word (laughs) coming through where people are not, it's not like there's huge areas. The traffickers are looking for where is the buyers. And so let's find the buyers and we're just going to transport these individuals to those areas. So some of the cases we've been involved with started in New Jersey, but came through Philadelphia, came through Lancaster, ended in York because they, they were able to do arrest charges. You've got Reading as another big area. And then again, Pittsburgh. And so there's this corridor, right? You're going across the different counties over to Pittsburgh. And it's like, okay, we're getting them across. Then let's get them into Ohio. So it's just this transport of these 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 sweet, innocent individuals that are being exploited wherever there's a buyer. So if we can stop the demand, our mission statement is to eradicate human trafficking and sexual exploitation. And people say, how can that be done in your lifetime? I said, if there's not a buyer, we wouldn't have this issue. So what can we do, one, to prevent it from ever happening in the first place and then help survivors so they're not re-victimized and resold and re-traumatized from what has happened to them? And so that will stop that. And then if we can get those buyers off the street, we, we would end this. And so that is what's making this where Pennsylvania is. And you're saying Lancaster, yes, there's Amish communities, but there's a lot of abuse in the church that we have seen through, it doesn't matter if you're a plain community, you could be a, a Pentecostal, you could be all Catholic, all these different entities of our faith, right? And there's abuse that happens and we're told to be silent. And so what we saw with Lancaster County, it's like, there's no way this could be happening here. And we said, okay, let's look at what trafficking actually looks like and who our population is. And so when your eyes are open to the reality, more people are like, wait, I never thought of it this way. Or, wow, I think that was my story as a kid and I never could identify or pinpoint that was my trauma. And so our heart is if we have a healed community, my word, the impact of those that can then help the women and youth that working with right here in our own backyards. Ooh, Amy, you are unpacking a lot. And I just want to go back to something you said that like, it just stood out to me when you were even talking about the different states of Philadelphia, Lancaster, York, Harrisburg, and Pittsburgh, but you said the buyers. When you said that, I was like, oh my goodness. I think, you know, there is buyers, there's a demand, and it's right oh, here yeah. in our city. So can you tell, talk to us a little bit about the, the buyers? Because I, I think there's, we know that there are, We call them traffickers, but the buyers. But can you talk to us a little bit about that? Because I think for someone like myself, I I, when you just said buyers, I was like, wait a minute, (laughs) like that's just a whole 
it just really <laughs> shattered my world. I'll, I'll be honest, Amy, like when you said buyers, I said that it just makes me feel sick to my stomach yeah. about buyers. And the, hard, the buyers, you know, we, we have to separate them. So there's the trafficker that that has the property of the victim, right? The, the one that says you're giving me your money or they're the one saying you owe me. So you're going to have to do these services. That trafficker could be a male or a woman. It, 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 there, we've seen teenagers that were trafficked traffickers because they were forced into doing that as well as women and men. But the buyers are the ones that are saying, hey, they're looking for that that sex, that experience. So you're looking at, so if you look at our venues for trafficking, where are these venues? Number one is pornography. That is fueling this. And majority of those that we've worked with were used in the porn industry. Let that sink in for a minute. Like the, we, we talk about, uh, you know, ending this demand. I, I'm really on to churches saying, hey, we need more to, to talk about pornography and fighting this addiction that individuals have. It, it's fueling this because there's buyers looking to pay for online um, meeting the need of what they need. So you're seeing that as number one, as pornography is the, the fueling of this, if that's where the buyers are. Then two, it's the illicit massage parlors. That's the second. So you you look at that industry of people going in. We know where those places are. We know the ones that are dark at night or, or that it's darkened, but then the lights are on underneath and it's open 24 hours. And so those are where people are saying, hey, I can meet my need and go here, you know, and, and get services needed. So those buyers are the ones saying, I have a problem. I have a, a sex need and I'm going to go find it. So if it looks like prostitution, it looks like you know, listen, massage parlors, it looks like um, strip clubs. But what's interesting is that strip clubs and prostitution is way down here. The other two were, again, everything that's online. So it's been switching to this online platform, which is what we saw with the, you know, during COVID, where there was an increase in demand for online. And so a lot of people dismiss like, well, if I'm, if I'm a teenager and I need extra money, I just want to feel like someone validates me if I just go online and do this, nobody knows me. No one's going to ever know that it's me. And they 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 give this themselves this false thinking that this is okay because this person told me I'll be safe. And so that's where those buyers come in to those industries and pay for that. Mm. Who you know, when you were just talking, Amy, just talk, um, we had a, moments ago, we talked to a man named name is Joe Sweeney with the Acervo Project. And he's, you know, they're on the front lines and working with government agencies and Homeland Security because of what's happening online and just, you know, the p porn industry and all of these things. And we're talking about the massage parlors because we've all driven past them and say like, oh, that looks creepy. I'm not going in there. But even when we were talking about the traffickers and the buyers and just understanding this complex system of exploitation so people can just... Ugh, just get their flesh fed. It's it's absolutely abhorrent. And, you know, um, just want to shift a little bit and talk about really the hope that you and your husband, Steve, and your team are doing with Hope Inspire Love, because you work with survivors and you work with those that are at risk youth, you know, to make them aware of, you know, these dangers and also to heal. So can you talk to us about the work that you do with survivors and those that are at risk? Yeah. So at, when we started in 2017, like I said, Steve was like the, the force behind it. And I said, Steve, like, I, I love education, but I love meeting people in the brokenness. Like my heart is to love people in that raw, vulnerable um, space. And I said, this is dark and this is heavy work. And, you know, we have a family. What does this mean for us? And it was the first uh, home of kids aging out of foster care that we met with. And I was giving them the prevention education. And, you know, after we're done, you're seeing all this emotion for the females, even the males, like in their home, just broken. And I'm going, I can't just leave them here like this. Like, there's something we've got to figure out what's going on. And so what's beautiful is I wasn't allowed to share my faith there, but I had a team of prayer warriors. I was like, hey, I brought my volunteers and they're, they're interceding and praying behind the scenes. And you know, afterwards, individually, they kept saying, Amy, can we meet with you? Can we talk with you? And as we're hearing their stories, I'm like, this is trafficking. This is exploitation. Like, we need to get them help. And after that, I, I looked at Steve and I said, we've got to do more than just prevention education. We have to meet them where they are because not everybody's going to go into residential. Not everybody's going to go into a shelter. Like, you know, they, they or they're in foster families. Like, how do we support those families and those individuals? And that's when God birthed the mentoring program for us. It was how often do have we had encounters with those that have mentored us and have loved us, right? Through the dark 
darkest seasons of our lives and who stayed with us. Even we're like, when we're a hot mess and we're not the kindest people, they're like, I still love you, you know? And so that is what we have seen that it's what it, it's relationships that have really transformed the longevity of healing. And the other part is, this isn't a short-term fix. We can all look at situations where we've lost somebody in our family or we're going through a really hard time personally. Everyone's there for you at the beginning, right? Everyone's like, okay, we're here for you. And then six months goes by or three months and you're like, where are all my people? It's kind of like you got forgotten. It was like emergency need. And us, us as a team, we're like, no, it's about every day just really trying to get back to that foundation and finding where that is. So that is what we see the hope be. We're seeing survivors say like, hey, listen, this is our mentorship program. We would love to put faith into it. If you're if you're welcoming the opportunity for us to pray with you or share that. And we've never had someone say no, which is beautiful because they don't all come from our walk of life and we don't force that on them. But we want them to have that experience. But it comes out with, hey, why do you have so much peace in your life? Why do you have so much joy? How do I overcome this so I can have what you have? And we get to share, hey, we may not have walked in your shoes and some have, but we can say we've walked through hard times. And if it's and it's because we've had people with us. We we say this line in our organization, relationship or trauma that happens through relationship can only be restored through healthy relationship. So you can't try to do it all these different ways if that's where the trauma happened. And so the longevity of what we've seen with women and youth we work with is that we haven't given up on them like everyone else. And the the job skill training and life skill development and spiritual foundation is all done through relationship. It's not a class you have to go to. It's all with just walking alongside somebody that just speaks life and you do life with them. Um, so that's where we're seeing that light. And we we say that passion for the one has led us here. Change lives is what keeps us going. And the young women have said to us, if it wasn't for Steve and that one, I wouldn't have been the one. And so I tell our team, listen, if one person shows up to our training, if one person shows up to our gathering, it's about the one and we're going to treat them like it's 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 a party for 50 people in that room. It doesn't change how we serve our community because it's always for the one. Mm. Amy, I love that way. Just I can just even hearing you speak in your passion, I just see the joy of the Lord just bursting forth from you. And I'm sure your husband has that same enthusiasm and heart. And just it's truly beautiful to hear how that one moment on that subway train ride going into Philadelphia, seeing that young little girl is really birthed a movement in your family, in your community, where you are on the front lines and you're making sure that you're making an impact and reaching those so that they don't fall into the grips of exploitation. And, you know, for more resources and information about Hope Inspire Love, you can go to hopeinspirelove.com, correct? Dot org. Hope Inspire Love. Hope Inspire Love.org. Amy, thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you so much for being on the front lines. And I am just excited to see what God is going to do moving forward with your ministry, with your organization, and your team, because it's truly beautiful. And I just know that so many of us that are watching on the Glory Hour right now, I know myself, I'm just taking away like, okay, what can I do? You know, being a voice of awareness, shedding light on the darkness, and being on the being part of the army, you know, to come against and battle like when it comes, you know, on the army of anti-trafficking, because it, you know, it needs to end, it needs to stop. And so thank you so much for all the work that you do. And thank you for this opportunity. I want to share with you a lot of people say, but I wouldn't know what to do. And so we would encourage you for the month of January, finish out this month and go into February on our website, hopeinspirelove.org. You could right on the main page right now, we have our 31 days of prayer and journal that we created of prayer and scripture to go along with every day for 31 days that you can join with us. And I say prayer is the best thing you can do. So do it with us. And that is going to help us, again, continue to shine this light. And the enemy has no place because we have people praying with us and interceding with us. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. It's prayer, 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 because we know there is power in intercession. When we go to the heavenly realm, that God will just, ching, 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 he'll go in because he is, I love that he is Adonai Savayot, that he is the Lord of the angel armies. And we grab, we join forces with him as the body of Christ and unite. So be sure to check that out and join the prayer journey with them. So thank you so much, Amy, for joining us today. We appreciate it. Y'all have a great day. 
What an eye-opening conversation with Amy Thurston from Hope Inspired Love, an incredible work her and her husband Steve are doing with their whole team in Lancaster, PA, raising awareness, shedding light on the darkness, the depravity, and the destruction, the spiritual destruction that happens when it comes to human trafficking. And you know, as always, as ending the show, I always seek the Lord and ask for what he wants me to share with you. And you know, this is what he dropped in my spirit, laid in my heart, and I really hope that you take a moment to listen to this. You know, whether trafficking is happening online or on the other side of the world, we cannot turn a blind eye to it. God is not pleased with this. And I believe that that's why we're seeing so much judgment happen across the earth. And in this hour and in this season, as we stepped into 2024, we've been seeing so much exposure that is happening. And I believe that the God of judgment, I believe the God of justice that he's raising up, we're going to see him even in such a more profound way because he is exposing the darkness. You know, the earth is the Lord and, you know, the earth, God owns the whole earth, right? This is his heart. His people are his heart. He hates to see people that are exploited, people that are hurting the orphan, the fatherless. And that's exactly what these people that are being influenced by demonic entities are doing, whether they're traffickers or they're buyers or wherever they are on the chain and the network when it comes to trafficking and sexual exploitation. It must stop. It must be something that we are committed to as the body of Christ to say no more. Enough is enough. Because you know what? These aren't just news headlines. These are people's lives. These are women and children, little boys and little girls. Think about if that was your son. Think about if that was your daughter. Think about if that was your grandchild. Think about if that was somebody in your family. I think sometimes we become so desensitized in our world because of all the bombardment of news and things going on. We're like, oh, that's really terrible and tough. But it becomes real when it happens happens to you and it's on your doorstep. For me, it was just very sobering hearing Amy talk about on a subway train that I would take daily every day, that same train that her, her husband was on, on his way to that interview. I've been on that train. I have seen some stuff in Philadelphia. There was even a moment God is even reminding me of that I went to the National Association of Black Journalists Convention that was in New Orleans years ago. And I'll never forget being down there. And this is when I was in my early 20s. And so I was still, I still love Jesus, y'all, but you know, I was turning up doing different things. But anyway, during that whole week, and I remember for the journalist convention, and there's people from media all across the country. And I'll never forget, I was out at this like hot, this bar club on Bourbon Street. And I was with one of my childhood friends. And I'll never forget that these men, that they were from, I don't know what country they were from. They were from a different country. And I'll never forget, they started speaking, went from English speaking to a different language. And my childhood friend, he was a, he was a male, um, and that we both worked at the same news station together. I am so thankful for him because he said, Sydney, we got to go because they were trying to lure me away. They were trying to isolate me. And I really believe they were about to traffic me and take me, especially in New Orleans, especially on Bourbon Street. So I really, I know in my spirit that something would have happened and I may have not been here and who knows where I could have been because it's that easy. It's that simple. It's that quick. So I just want to encourage you today, as we've had these conversations with Joe Sweeney, and you heard his heart and his passion of when he was in the Middle East and he got that call that changed everything, and how now they're helping government agencies and Homeland Security, and they're going in and they're you know, being a resource to make sure that these children are getting rescued because these pimps are online, they're on social media. We heard about Amy and what her husband are doing with Hope Inspired Love, that they're in central Pennsylvania making an impact, making a difference, because it took those one moments when it became so real that they stepped into action. So I want to ask you, what can you do? I'm encouraging you today to seek God, to pray, seek his face. He will give you direction. It may be just raising awareness. It may be giving to one of these organizations financially. Whatever it may be, march it. You, there's something that we all can do. Because I truly believe God put this in my spirit. He spoke to me even before January that he told me when I was, you know, I, I seek the Lord for every show. I ask him for direction. I say, Holy Spirit, what do you want for the glory hour? Because this isn't, this isn't my show. It's God's show. I lay it at his feet. I say, God, have your way with this. And he spoke to me that he said on this day that it's going to be released on January 17th. And when the days to come that he said that's the day he wanted to be focused on human trafficking after I read that article about the Rohingya refugee girls being child brides, he spoke clearly to me. Then he said, look up, look up the month. Look up the month that it's going to happen in. January, Human Trafficking Awareness Month. I cannot make this up. And then God 
in his divinity and his providence, lined up the connections, and that's where we are today and what you watched. So I just wanted to share my heart with that because we see what's going on in the Jeffrey Epstein case. We see how, you know, allegedly celebrities and public figures can be associated like this. Folks, this is like right in front of our eyes. So what are we going to do? And I want to leave you with this scripture because this is what God laid on my heart because I said, God, what, what, what do you want to say? But his word is the most perfect thing that when we go to his word, we receive wisdom, revelation, and direction. And it's a scripture I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Isaiah 60, one through two, says this. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The darkness. Y'all, we see the darkness. We see what's happening in our communities. We see what's happening in our cities. We see what's happening in our country and nations around the world. But you know what? For those of us that are in Christ, for those of us that are on Team Jesus, for those of us that are with Adonai Savayot, the Lord of the Angel Armies, for those of us who say that we are on the front lines when it comes to the gospel, this is what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to be a voice for the voiceless. So I just encourage you today, make that step, make that phone call, Pray, give, seek, act, so that we will see modern day slavery, human trafficking, end in our day. Have a good one.